In this video, I'm going to uh, start a series, uh, well, this is the first of three videos on the revision for literature paper two. Um, year 10s have their mocks next week, and I thought I'd make a video. Um, I did a revision session today, and I thought I would do a quick one on just similar to the Jekyll and Hyde and Romeo and Juliet ones to review the context and the themes of this play, Inspector Calls by J.B. Priestley, and then how to answer a question. Um, this is an image from the recent BBC um, uh, adaptation of the play. I think it's quite good, even though in my heart I do really like the old um, black and white version too. But here it's good to see the inspector, Eric, Mr. Burling, Sheila, her fiancé, Gerald, and Mrs. Burling. The character who's missing, obviously, is Eva Smith. And Eva Smith never shows up in the play. She's discussed a lot. In the movie version, she is shown. She is dramatized. She does get a voice. But crucially and priestly, she doesn't. Um, the easiest way to think about the play are through these main characters. The more advanced character is the inspector, and we're going to look at that a little bit later in the video. And then even, I'd say the most advanced question, I think, would be, and it has appeared in the past, on Eva Smith. So let's begin with context. Okay, no, let's actually begin with what happens in the play. So just in case for some of you who can't remember, um, uh, Gerald Burling is going to get married to Sheila. Sorry, Gerald Croft is getting married to Sheila Burling. And the Crofts and the Burlings are rivals of industry, and their families are united. Conspicuously, the Crofts aren't at this meal, and there's some suggestion that maybe um, they think the Burlings are below them. But they, this gets interrupted by an inspector showing up who says there is, um, there's been a girl that's died and there's some connection. And he goes individually through the different characters and everyone in the family is connected to this girl, Eva Smith. Um, when the inspector leaves, Gerald returns to discover that perhaps he, was, he isn't who he said he was. Um, his name is Inspector Ghoul which is a pun on ghoul as in ghost, and so there's some sense that he was a kind of spirit or conscience. And they, you know, Gerald, Mr. and Mrs. Burling think they've gotten away with it. Eric and Sheila feel really regretful. Um, there's a real division in that moment where they think it didn't happen, it was not real. And then, of course, Priestley ends his play with a phone call announcing the arrival of an actual inspector. What was he trying to say in putting this play together? Well, I think Priestley was politically sympathetic with socialism. And in many ways, the inspector could be seen as a stand-in, or it's traditionally seen as a stand-in for himself. He wanted to show the audience how cruel the rich were. Uh, Mr. Burling won't pay his workers properly. He fires the striking Eva Smith. Sheila Burling gets... Eva fired um, because she laughed in a store. Um, Gerald, uh, who, while being mildly kind to Eva Smith, nonetheless does to some extent use her. Mrs. Burling, a wealthy um, head of a charity, turns her back on her. Eric um, physically uh, assaults her, steals, but suffers no consequences. The rich are cruel in this play. He wanted to show that everyone, we have a responsibility for one another. And so classically, it's Mr. Burling who feels that we don't and the inspector who feels that we do. And Sheila and Eric move towards the inspector's position. Um, he also wanted to show how really difficult and unfair the life of the poor were, were in 1912, particularly for women. Eva Smith in her pregnancy and the way she's treated is very crucial, I would say, that she's a woman. And he set the play in 1912, even though it was 1945, before the two major world wars, to kind of show an arc of how much has really changed in that time. Well, context is something that's assessed, and it's important to understand when reading and writing about the play. It was first performed in 1945, not in London, but actually in the, in the USSR in the Soviet Republic of Russia and a communist state. Um, and he took he made the play take place in 1912 and set in England before the war to make a commentary on England. Now, in the context of 1944, what we, what we understand is Europe has been, and Russia in particular, have been absolutely devastated uh, by the war. 
And in England, there was a kind of weariness with the inequalities that led to war. And I think this play explores that. Russia itself had a revolution in 1917. And the inspector makes, he alludes to this when he says, uh, better to ask for the earth than to take it away, he says to Mr. Berlin. And Priestley's rejecting capitalism and praising socialism. I think it's quite clearly ideologically positioned in this play. And Priestley suggests that the rich are really arrogant and capitalism is really arrogant and leads to its own destruction. Um, very much what we see happening in this play. In the 1912, in the imaginary time, you know, because, you know, um, and, you know, the other, the other thing to note is it's 2018 now. So you have 1945, 1912, and 2018, three different contexts. Right now we read the play with a certain distance, uh, imagining even further in the past. So we get both of these contexts. But for the viewers in the USSR, they were getting these two contexts. Both what's it like now, post-Second World War, what was it imaginary before the First World War? Well, in terms of workers' rights, there was no minimum wage, no limits on working hours or conditions, and workers had to work six days a week. Really rough. And we really see that in Eva Smith, in the portrayal and discussion of Eva Smith. Um, for a woman who was pregnant, there was no social housing, no unemployment payments, nor health care. So being sick, being ill, being pregnant, these were incredibly difficult things to negotiate. Um, the rich weren't just rich, but they were super rich. Um, it, it, for us, anyway, they had servants and their power was extraordinary. You really see that with the Burlings. Um, and you get the sense that you either own or are owned. Or, or another way of putting it is you're the owner you, 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 or you did what you were told. Sorry, you're the owner. You're the person who gets told and obeys orders or you basically starve. And this context is further important to understand the importance of 1912 and the extreme extremities uh, placed on Eva Smith. Um, broadly, one of the major contexts of the play is, as we said earlier, capitalism and socialism. So capitalism as represented by Bur the Burlings, Mr. Burling ha has this idea that uh, you don't, people have no responsibility for anyone else except ourselves. He thinks to think elsewise would be awkward. Um, capitalism argues for the concentration of wealth and valorizes the ownership of capital and that greed and reputation animates this mentality that how you are seen and how much you have are important ways to understand who you are. In contrast, the socialism of Priestley and his proxy in The Inspector moves Eric and Sheila. This idea is that we're all interconnected and we're all responsible for each other and the wealth of the society should be distributed so that the weakest amongst us doesn't have to suffer. These two political philosophies really animate um, the play. And it's a, if you're going to learn one context for the play, this would be it. Um, so ultimately, the play shows how capitalism uses and abuses others, particularly women, out of greed. It further shows there is, there is hope for change. And we see that in Eric, Sheila, and possibly Gerald. I mean, Gerald is a real halfway house figure. The inspector kind of celebrates Gerald for how he treated Eva Smith. There's some sense that Gerald might reconcile with Sheila. Sheila says, it's the first time I've seen you honest. On the other hand, Gerald is the one that says the inspector is fake. He seems to be unmoved um, by uh, the, the fact they've done something wrong. Um, and you see in Gerald, he could go either way. It's very basically structured play in that sense. Um, this potential of change in the upper classes is also a potential of change for you in the audience. The inspector's great speech about everyone being responsible for each other, millions of Eva Smiths and John Smiths, as if to say this narrative, the story we've been told is the story of our society. Everyone is going through this. Um, so that's just a really brief outline of the context and the themes of Inspector Calls. Now I'm just gonna remind you, you, you know, you have 45 minutes for this question. Um, I would say five minutes, 35, and five is how I break that down. You definitely need to plan. You write, you should edit. It's crucial to edit to do well uh, in English. Um, let's see how it is that we answer. Okay, well, you do get a choice of question. 
Unlike with paper one, there's no extract. So this is very challenging. You have to remember or approximate small quotes. Now, if you go to Quizlet and find the Dr. Jane, you will find slides for all my quotes for all every portion of this exam. And I highly recommend you download that onto your phone. It's a free app and you can start revising. Otherwise, you need to make your own notes and start remembering small little quotes for each character. A good way might be to think of three major quotes. Um, an essay I'm looking for would be an introduction plus three or four paragraphs, depending on how you write. You'd have small quotes that you analyze and explain. AO2 form, you'd consider this a dramatic presentation like Romeo and Juliet. You think about character, the audience, staging, costume, a number of different things um, that you could analyze. And finally, of course, you need context. And in a lot of AQA's exemplar material, it is the context that carries the day. It helps, um, because context will always be there. As long as it's relevant and you apply it, it will continue to move your argument forward. It will help you accommodate the limited quotes you may have in your memory. So context is really crucial. That's why we spend so much time. So character could be Burling, Sheila, Gerald, Mrs. Burling, Eric, or the inspector. And of course, the advanced one would be Eva Smith. Theme, responsibility, inequality, change, generations. These are just some of the major ones. Themes, there could be more themes, but I think if you could figure out how to get back to one of these kind of base themes, it would help a lot. Um, I used to think it's going to be character or theme, but now they, it could be either two characters, two themes. I used to think also the character was the easiest one to write about. And I, I it, it may very well be, but I think theme is actually the one where you can do more with. So just generally what you're going to think about with character is three moments for the character. But also what I would want you to think about is character relationships. So if, because you, you can't just write about the character in isolation, Mrs. Burling. With Mrs. Burling, her son really hates her by the end of the play, so inherently you're speaking about Eric. You could write about every character's relationship to the inspector, and then you could do Sheila, or you could do Mr. Burling. But what you'd want to do, in addition to writing about the character, is their somewhat their connections to others. If it's theme, this is what I'm saying, it might be a little bit easier. You'd pick one character, and you'd apply it to the theme. One character to the theme, one character to the theme. That might be easier because whereas you'd have to marshal your three quotes on Mrs. Burling throughout this entire essay, if you did one paragraph on Mrs. Burling, you could use all three of them. All three on the inspector, all three on Mr. Burling. So in a weird way, this one, actually I'm starting to believe, might be a better one to write. It all depends on you, though. There's no inherent benefit. Uh, so, character. If you're analyzing character, the emphasis for me is the idea of change. So, characters are presented before the inspector shows up, during what I call the interrogation, or how the inspector questions you, the character is shown in a way then, and then afterwards, towards the end of the play, either after the inspector leaves, or something towards the end. That is a really easy trajectory to encapsulate the whole play. Ultimately, the interrogation is going to be the more profound, so this might actually be two paragraphs, probably, because these are going to be a little bit shorter. Or, alternatively, you can make this one very large paragraph. It's up to you. Theme would be a little bit different. You'd get a question like generational conflict. You'd want to show the, the tension between Burling, the Burlings and their kids. So Burling Sheila, Mrs. Burling Sheila. Mrs. Burling Eric, Mr. Burling Eric. That would be, if I was sketching out how I would answer a thematic question, would be something like that. So you'd be encapsulating a lot of different characters. Um, and you'd what you'd want to think about, if you were planning that, is four different contexts as well. You want to have one context to help push those paragraphs forward. So Burling and Sheila disagree on the idea that they're not cheap labor, they're people. So you have that workers and strikes context, which you should look up and learn. Um, Mrs. Burling and Sheila are two sides of this feminist coin. So women's rights might be something to think about. 
Mrs. Burling, the head of a charity, a kind of pr horrible precursor to the very equitable um, uh, uh, but eroding welfare state we have, is really in conflict with Eric. You know, Eric didn't know his, um, that Eva Smith was pregnant, and with no welfare state, she really was left to begging a charity, and we saw what happened. And then, of course, Eric versus Burling. Eric seems to be moving more towards socialism. Burling is the firm capitalist. You see, when you have this context firmly in your mind and can apply it in a relevant way, all your paragraphs can move forward. We're running way over time, so I'm just going to go quickly. You need two quotes per paragraph. I think here I would do four paragraphs because it's generational conflict. Um, another example of something you may want to revise is a character question, the most complicated one. What is the function of the inspector? So in an introduction, you'd want to think about what's the purpose of him, what characters link to him, how does Priestley present him, and what context is relevant to him. For me, I would put all of that in the introduction. I would have Inspector Burling, Inspector Sheila, and Inspector Gerald be my three paragraphs. And, well, we could do more on that now, but I can show you, um, I did in the revision session, I have a whole essay plan but I don't think I'm going to do it necessarily right now. What you just need to think about is um, the description, you, context, character, the function of the character, themes, all in the introduction, and then three extended peewee paragraphs with at least two quotes per paragraph and context. If you can do that three times, you're going to be great for Inspector Coles. You have five minutes to plan, 35 minutes to write, and finally, five minutes to edit for this first question on the paper two English literature exam.